Name and job title, please. Uh, Alex Tudor. Job title, Kim Bolton, cricket professional. Uh, sir, there's a, we've done an episode... I, mean, I, I want to say we did it a couple of weeks ago, but it's quite clear we're in the same T-shirt, so everyone will know that uh, we just did it. We're, we're doing back-to-back ones. But we did an episode recently about fast bowling. The yeah. other thing that fast bowlers are made to do other than uh, you know uh, survive the tyranny of the speed gun is that they have to um, go in and be night watchers, right? And yeah. because you could bat a little bit, I'm assuming... Uh, that you were probably used for that role a lot. So you have a lot of personal uh, feelings on that. Uh, what was your theory as a fast bowler who's put his boots up, had a hard day, and now some batter has said, do you mind just going out and doing my job for me for a couple of minutes in the dark? Listen, I, I've said this more than once, right? I am most probably best known for what I did as a night watchman, obviously for England when I got my night, on, night out, okay? But... <laughs> I don't agree with it. It, it. it baffles me. It's it's like it's a tradition that you have this night watchman. Why? You are asking a player with less ability to go and face generally a brand new ball against the, you know, if you're playing international cricket, the world's best bowlers, a county cricket, the opening bowlers of said county, which generally had an, um, an overseas player, and gone to five, where the batter that is paid to go and get runs is technically more gifted and is more able to deal with that situation. You no, know, you put your feet up <laughs> and I will go and face the music. It makes no sense to me. I understand in certain situations where, yes, that needs to happen. But generally, I don't agree with it. And it's a case of, I know people want to say, oh, it's the bat of the bowler scenario. But it is a little bit because it's like, batters are pampered. End of it is, batters are pampered. We will look after you, just make sure you're okay. You you just take it easy, even though, you know, you've been filled in all day. Um, the openers have gone in. You've got your pads on. But if a wicket goes down with, I don't know, four or five overs to go, you won't go in and, and I will go in and I now have to face a brand new ball, a bowler who has just got his tail up because he's got one of the openers out and is a highly skilled individual. That's most probably going to make it difficult for me. So how on earth am I going to survive the amount of balls that generally you should be doing? And it's a total tradition thing. It's laughable for me that it still happens in this game where, you know, we still want to be ultra positive and it's just go out there and play and, and let's make it entertaining. Mm. But I, I just think it's something that's gone on for the test of time in cricket. I know Steve Ward didn't agree with it either. He didn't have a night watchman. So respect to Mr. War for that. Um, but I think a lot of people hide behind the night watchman type thing. And, and it's a thing. I said, listen, I get scenarios where if there's not many overs left in the day, then yes, it may make sense for, you know, and generally it's someone that can hold a bat. It's not mm. like sending a rabbit out. It makes no sense because they ain't going to last too long. But it's someone that can generally bat, lower, lower all the batter can generally bat, then it might make sense, you know. Um, so the, the batter starts fresh in the morning to go and do what they're, mm. they're paid to do. But sometimes it's, you know, there's like 10 overs left in the day and you see a night watch movies. Like, why? Mate, go out there and bat. Like, that's <laughs> well, a good job. Go out there and bat. I do. Go and get a little 10 not out. <laughs> so then you come in the morning, you got some runs on the board, and go out there and bat. You know, I, I did see Rahat Ali do it in a test match once, uh, and he certainly can't bat. So it's not always people who can bat, <laughs> is it? Um, so the tradition thing is worth stating that, like most things in this game, it's a bit like why bowlers aren't captains, right? Mm. It's because traditionally the bowlers were the professionals. And they came from yeah. the working class background. So how could they possibly lead posh lads? And mm. it's very similar when it comes to night watchers, right? It was uh, the, the, ba the pampered batters, as you said, in your day and age, that was the professionals. But in the old days, that was the gentleman who didn't Ooh. want to go out and bat when it was a bit sticky or a bit dark. Bit or, it's a bit dark. Yeah, yeah Spoffers exactly. is coming in with his mustache or whatever. So <laughs> the tradition, it, 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 so it automatically starts from a position of weakness. And I'll, I'll put two things to you. Very rarely do we see double night watch, right? which tells you straight away that the theory 
doesn't quite make as much sense because if you really believed in it, you'd back it up with a second one. And the other one is um, in the history of test cricket, and there's a great article. uh, It was uh, Ananta Nairan who wrote this. It's a really, really cool article about, he went through and basically tried to work it out mathematically who had done it and who hadn't, you know, got rid of people like Wazim Akram and, you know, Andy Bickle, anyone he thought was too good, he took out. So he was looking for not people who went up to, to score quickly. He he took out anyone who, you know, batted at number seven or higher and all those Mm. sorts of things. Mm. And he found only 17 times in the history of cricket where we've seen someone go out as night watch opener. Mm. Right. So uh, Jack right. Leach was one of those. We saw he made yes. that runs against Ireland. Very rare. Yes. It happens. If it was, why are we not doing it for openers, but we are doing it for everyone yeah. else? Like you're straight yeah. away starting from a position of weakness where you're saying, well, we're only going to pick which players are going to do it anyway. It's just as hard for the openers to go out with four overs to go if the big guy's steaming in after a bad day as it is for well, anyone else. Like as a bowler, I could not care who I get out. At the end of the day, my wicket column says wicket. My tail is up. So if I get out a night watchman, that's a wicket. My tail is up. The player coming in, they're going to be in trouble. Like, it makes, like, it, it, sometimes it baffles me. Honestly, it really does. It's like, if you think about it, I know obviously some people pride themselves on, oh, when I get my wickets, it's normally the top five, top six, whatever. Mm. But generally, it's like, I could not care less, right? Because in the book, it says out. In your stats, it says wickets. I am happy to get wickets. I couldn't care less. There's been days when you're bowling very well and you don't get any and you bowl like a drain and you bowl wickets. That just happens. So you telling me, like Watchman's in, a bowler's licking his lips. Bowler is licking his lips. He's thinking, hopefully this is an easy wicket. That's going to go towards my column. That's going to going to go towards my stats at the end of the season. Then the batter's coming in. Bowler's got his tail up. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. So I'm just thinking, just go out there and bat. And as you said, which was so right, it's a it's a sign of weakness for me when the batter doesn't want to come out. It's like actually you're a little bit nervous, mm-hmm. which is fine. But everyone's a bit nervous. But it's like, but that is your job. Where if when I flip the coin. If there's five or so overs to go at the end of the day, do you see a non-bowler bowling? Yeah, and yeah, at that stage, you probably have, your bowlers are exhausted, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They have bowled all day and you are still saying, no, no, we just need that last bit of effort out of you. We need that last bit of effort out of you because yeah. it is your job. And then suddenly when it's batters, we go, no, no, no. Yeah. We'll, we'll get one of the big fellas out there in the pads or get send out some fr- poor spinner who doesn't have a back lift to go out there. Exactly. It's such a... So- remarkably weird way of thinking about it. And I think you and I are probably in the same position that there are some times where you think it makes sense. Like the yes. last, last yeah, two overs, I'm not, I'm not terrible like... wicket. Maybe there's, yeah. I mean, there are probably times and we'll get to them later on. Matthew Holgard and Jason Gillespie are probably more likely not to go out than a top order batter just because they don't move their back. Right. Yeah. They just it's had a straight, literally... yeah, yeah, there's yeah, no pop, back pop, pop. lift. So you yeah. have to get through them. So there are, yeah. and, and, but, but in that case, that's a bit more like what we were talking about before, where, I don't know, was a Macram's going to come in at eight, but you want to get a couple mm. of runs, so you send him up yeah. the order, or Andy Bickle, or whoever yeah. whoever that sort of yeah. player is, right? 100%. That's a tactical thing. This isn't mm. really as much of a tactical thing, is that it's a traditional thing. Mm. Someone gets the nod. And, and the other thing that you hear is, oh, well, you know, the, the batter might get an unplayable ball. <laughs> a batter might get an unplayable ball at any time in their innings, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> I, I don't, I've never understood that, that kind of thinking. And, and mm. I do understand that there's less to gain for a batter than there is for a night watch in that situation. Yes. But, but also if you are, to, if, if I, I don't believe in momentum in cricket, but cricketers tell me it is hundred percent real. Why would you gift a wicket when you don't have to? No, hundred percent. But I, I also, and Alan Butcher, who I love, um, always says, if you pack your team, with a load of batters. So sometimes, remember, England were going through that stage where they just wanted to play another batter. Mm. They wanted to play another batter. All what happens is the batters at the top generally say, well, don't worry, you know, Butler will get it because he's coming in at seven. Or, and you've got Ali at eight. And, you know what I mean? So all of a sudden, people are just shifting yeah. the, the workload to someone else where if it was, you've got five bowlers, five batters, you've got the all-rounder, You've got the keeper at seven, 
And then you've got your batters who can do a little, your bowlers who can do a little bit, and then you've got your bowlers, right? Mm. You know that that top five, six, need to score the runs. But if you're now lengthening that to sort of seven, eight, nine, it's like, ah, don't worry. You know, even if we're three, four down, we've got like a proper batter yeah. coming in at seven, eight. It just shifts the responsibility. If you're playing with no, we're batting five recognised batters, all round the keeper or whatever way it is, keeper all round or whatever way it is, um, and then your bowlers who can bat a bit, and then your bowlers. It's just like that's that's me. That's a, that's the team. It's like you packing your you're scared. <laughs> you're, you're scared. Why are you scared? Why are you packing your team with eight batters, seven batters? Just bat. But then again, the game as I love it, it is a very it is batsman orientated. I get it. People want to see runs. They don't want to see teams get bowled out for a hundred, and you know, I mean, it doesn't make for a great spectacle. Even though you know, bowlers are bowling well, and bats haven't quite figured out the technique. And they, as I said, it's fine when the wicket's flat, but as soon as the wicket does a bit, techniques get found out. No one's willing to put that them hard yards in, and you know, maneuver the crease and work it in different areas. That's why I always say when people ask me the question, "Who's the best player?" I said, don't get me wrong, I bowled at 10 Dorka, Pont and all these, but I said, Darren Lehman, for me, is the cleverest batter that I bowled at because he found a way. He found a way. If it was Seaman, he found a way of scoring runs. When I had Saki and Souls at Surrey, he made it extremely hard for them. You know, he would sweep, he would hit him downtown, he hit him in different areas. Um, and that was in county cricket where, you know, he was playing at Headley, which, you know, a little bit bowler friendly, but he scored his runs, mm-hmm. thousand runs plus every, every season. You know, um, I said every any any decent batter can score runs on flat wickets when it's not moving off straight. Uh, the bowler can't get it above your waist. You know, anyone can get runs. Everyone's queuing up to get runs then, but when it's difficult, when the ball is seaming around, it's a bit of tinge of green on it. It's hitting the seam. It's seaming. Right, show me what you got then. That's batsmanship for me. And I don't see it a lot now. Um, it's always a debate that I have with um, Away Shah. Whenever people are nicking off, I'm like, see? see ball seeming around, batters are moaning. It's like, you know, show me your, show me your class. Show me why you're world class. Mm. Don't just get runs when it's in your favour and it's not doing anything. Well, that's- get, show me someone who can get runs when it's seeming all over the place and you have to see off a spell from Jimmy and Brody and then, you know, Ollie Robinson's coming in and he's going to bowl a heavy spell with seven overs of, you know, not giving you much. Can you see that off? And then as they get tired, you start to pick them off. Yeah. Now that's batsmanship for well, me. You know so I mean? you're, it's interesting that, that you say all that because you're at the top level. So in, in Ananth's, um analysis, he's got... Um, he cuts it off at an average of 20. And I think you end up averaging 19. So you're just under that. In first yeah. class cricket, yeah, you miss, so you're just the night watch in his, <laughs> in his mass. But yeah, um, it, you average 22 in first class cricket. That's usually mm. batting eight, eight or nine, I would assume. Does eight. that sound right? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it's sorry, eight or nine. Yeah, yeah eight right. Or nine. You are now going in ahead of someone who is not just a first class player who's batting in the top four or five and you played for a pretty good county so you had a lot of mm. very good first class players but you're playing yeah. against one of the best bat- ahead of one of the best batters in the world you know uh, top, the, the best in England you're going up the difference between someone who can average 22 at 8 or 9 when he's coming in against third, fourth change bowlers um, in England mm. uh, they're already a bit tired because they've been bowling for mm. a little bit they probably don't have the new ball as much when you go into bat mm. and the difference between facing a new ball against the best bowlers in the world it's not even it's not even the same universe, right? <laughs> like it's a completely different kind mm. of challenge. And I think from mm. that perspective, I, I don't think that has been factored in of of when we're thinking about you know what you are used to doing as a batter. And the other thing is, I'm sure you did it for in first class cricket at times as well. And you know, as you were coming up, yeah, Jesus. Well, you know, as you say, I played in a very good side. So when I came into bat, generally I had to face the new ball. Yeah. Because, you know, Butch and Wardy or Darren Bickle before then or whatever, and then Ramps at three, uh, Adam at four, Ali Brown at five. Yeah. You know what I mean? Those guys are getting runs. So when I'm coming in, 
it's generally end of the day. Second new ball. Second new ball. Yeah. But there's you know a big I mean? difference so, between end of the day, second new ball. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. In, of in course. a first class so, game. Yeah. But my point is, there's no way for you to prepare properly for this because you probably did night watch a couple of times for Surrey, right? But yes, it's I did, not yeah. something that you do all the time because it's not something that happens all the time, right? No. And, and we you and can't we, prepare and we properly. Into- yeah, and, Ad, and under Adam, Adam was a little bit like Steve Waugh. He yeah. was like, he, not that he didn't believe in it. Obviously, we used that a bit, but he was like, no, you, you, we want to play positive cricket. You get your ass out there and you're back. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what we're doing. Regardless of out or not, we will back ourselves more often than not. So we didn't always use it. And you're talking about Night Watchmen. You had Bicknell, Salisbury, Tudor, Sacklane, who had a, a Test 100 at... Sometimes nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Jimmy Orman, you know, who could bat as well. So it's like, eh, you know what I mean? It's like you had lads who could bat. You know, Bickers. What? What did he? I don't know. Bickers got plenty double figures of fifties. A few, I think, three, four hundreds. He's got Ian Salisbury has got first class hundreds. Mm. You know, me, I got a couple of first class hundreds. Saki. Has a test hundred. Um, I don't know if he got a hundred at Surrey. I'm not too sure, but he got runs. You know, so even if the top order failed, you know, between us three or four, we would get a hundred runs. So if we were 150, 170 for six or so, we would end up 300. Yeah. And with the bowling lineup we had, that was more than enough sometimes. Okay, but it was, you know, I mean, it wasn't easy runs. Um, you know, you had to work hard and you were batting either with one of the gun batters ramps more often than not <laughs> that carried his bat. So you'd be batting with ramps, you'd be batting to try and get him to his double hundred or 150 or whatever it was. Um, and you're batting for the other person. But it, again, it's just, again, game situations, mm-hmm. scenarios, uh, analysing, yeah, this person's bowling a heavy spell. I need to try and see him off. Um you know, they can't keep going, even though he most probably feels like wickets around the corner. He's getting tired. This ball's not hitting the bat exactly the same. I don't reckon he's got long. Okay, third, fourth change bowlers coming on. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see some willow. You know what I mean? It's just that's how, that's how you try and play the game. I said people not thinking sometimes. For me, it's like they're just playing one type of form of cricket. Mm. They just want to play this ultra positive, positive, positive. I'm like, sometimes the game scenario doesn't need you to, to do that. You need to rein it in a little bit. This person is bowling a heavy spell, but they ain't going to bowl all day. See them off. It'll get easier. Make them bowl third, fourth, fifth spells. You know, going out there gun ho all the time. You know, the bowlers are still fresh. Mm. He's coming back second, third spell. He's still feeling quite good. You're going to be in trouble, you know. Uh, so I've got stats for you. I think you like this. So Go on, big man. according to according to Ananta, fi- this is up until 2018. 558 innings uh, in Test cricket qualified as someone coming in as a night watch. Right. Mm. Of those, 48 uh, percent survived the day. Right. When I first wow. thought that, I was like, oh, maybe it's more successful than I thought. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, how many times would that be? Like they only had to face three balls or nine oh, balls right. or whatever. So it's not yeah, a lot yeah. of balls that you sometimes have to face. Uh, 40, 40 times someone um, went over 99 balls and 99 runs. So you did you did the combo there. Yeah. Um, so that was about, that's about 7% of the time that happened. So it's very rare. What you did very was very, very rare. Uh, very rare. Moderately successful is 50, over 50 balls or 50 runs. That's happened 13% of the time. Um, right. And, but it still means that 31% don't make it to the end of the day. Now, when you think about the fact that I would say the majority of night watch innings are probably less than eight overs and you're probably facing mm. less than four of those overs um, yourself, mm. it does tell you that it doesn't work as much um, as, as you thought. The other thing is that they, the one thing that isn't talked about enough is that a tail ender and you're you're probably not the right person to have here, but someone like Matthew Hoggard, as good as he was mm. as blocking the ball out, is not particularly yeah. what you want the next morning, right? No, nah, you, you, you're literally saying, right, miss one, yeah. and let the batters get in. And, yeah, he, he, yeah, can't, yeah. he wasn't a particularly good runner between wicket. He never looked for no. runs. He didn't even understand how, <laughs> how to run physically, let alone turn the bat to get any, right? That wasn't how he batted. Um, 
And you lose momentum in the innings, uh, you know, from that perspective, especially if you if the next day you have started really, really well. Mm. Um, and just the overall thing of, again, you're slightly different in this, but I'll put someone like Gillespie, I'd probably put in this. Most tail enders are not good runners between wickets because they haven't run between wickets much in their life, right? That's mm. not what they're, they're used to doing. It does mm. cause other issues that people don't always think about. No, 100%. I mean, you know, someone going to watch a game of cricket in the morning thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to see Root and Johnny B and all of those come in and bat. And no disrespect, Leach is in there. And you're thinking, you know, he's doing a job because, you know, he can bat. And you're like, yeah, we haven't come to play to watch you bat. Like, you need to nick one off, you know what I mean? And it does, it starts to draw out because then the game you're thinking, now the batters need to get in there so we can kick on a little mm. bit and they can just get in there and bat. And you do, you start eating up balls. Um, again, it's just knowing the situation and stuff. Like some will go like, okay, I've got half an hour to have some fun the next morning and I'm just going to flay the bat. And mm. if I get 20, I've done my job, but then I'll get out and then the batters come in and they do do their work. But then some start thinking, no, no, man, this, I'm auditioning here, you know, <laughs> like 10 runs off. 40 balls, 50 balls, you're thinking, oh, God's sake, like, you know what I mean? The night before, that was, you know, that's needed. If, you know, as you said, you know, um, you might face four four overs, okay, so 24 balls, you're thinking, okay, you've done your job. Now you need to either slap it all over the place mm. the next morning, you've got half hour, slap it all over the place, or get out. Literally. But as you say, it doesn't always happen that way. And also, the, the kind saying, of person that you send in to be the guy who blocks, is really going to be the sort of person who can then slap it around. Like, if you're a tail ender, you yeah, probably yeah. have one skill, right? It's either blocking yeah. or it's slogging. The or combination slogging. of both is pretty, it, you know, Rare. then you should be a batter Rare. at that point or at least be it's, up the order a little bit. So the whole yeah. thing doesn't make as much sense when you start to break it down from that way. Um, best night watchers of all time, yourself excluded from this conversation, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie uh, did it uh, nine yeah, in nine innings, he made 327 runs in that. <laughs> but it is worth mentioning that one of those was a double century in double Bangladesh. Double century against Bangladesh. Yeah. yeah, but he only failed once in his nine attempts when he went out. So wow. every other time he made it to the close of play. And if you've ever seen Jason Gillespie bat, uh, you know, yes, he, I have, yeah. Yeah, he bats like what? He, he bats like an, a 70-year-old man in a club game. I hope <laughs> Dizzy doesn't. But he does, right? <laughs> one of those guys, you just like, well, he's watching the ball really, really closely. There's no back mm. left. And all he's mm. really trying to do is perhaps nudge it to the leg side and take a single, <laughs> right? So in some ways, if you have someone like him, and it's this, the weird thing about all this is, we've just talked about that Steve Waugh was the person who went away from Night Watchers when he may have mm. had one of the best ones of all time at his disposal. At his disposal. Yeah. The person who's done it the most is not a particularly good batter. It's James Anderson, right? Who's done it. Jimmy. Yeah. He, this is up until 2018 as well, and he'd done it 23 times. I can't imagine he's done it too many times since then because they probably had slightly better batting lineups um, in that time. Mm. Um, he made it uh, 33%. Uh, so he averaged 33 balls per innings. So he actually did pretty good at it. Uh, yeah. And he made it to stump 75% of the times. You mentioned wow. one of the other ones. Saklane Mushak did it 11 times. And yeah. um, he actually averaged 44 balls per time. And that's without, like, you know, he never made a big 100 or anything like uh, no. uh, like um, Dizzy did or anything like that. Dizzy, so that yeah. is just, he was very good at it. Another one, which this makes a lot of sense, Nathan Lyon did it 12 times. Oh, guess, yeah, yeah. Um, he got, he, he faced 31 balls per innings. He's probably, this was a few years ago. He's a better bat now. So his record might even be even better at that. Ishant Sharma, who I would put in the Jason Gillespie, Matthew Hoggard um, mm. situation of not not actually having any shots um, mm. and so quite well suited to it. He would go 29 balls per innings. This is the interesting one. Matthew Hoggard is on the list. He's done it 11 times. So he's up there with the guys who've done it the most ever. But yeah. he only went, he only stayed for 23 balls per innings. Um, and so he wasn't particularly okay, as successful mm. as some of these other guys. So I do think there is a type of batter, if you have them, where – and I think the Ishan Sharma, Matthew Hoggard, Jason Gillespie type of players make a lot mm. of sense, right? Sakhalin mm. Mushak, I'm like, I think you can just leave him later in your order and let him to bat properly. I, yeah, I yeah. Saki, Saki, Saki could bat. I mean, I've, I've obviously I've been lucky enough, blessed enough to play with Saki, and we used to have some fun. Mm. Uh, as I said, you had Bicknell, Tudor, Salisbury, Sakhalin, sort of from eight up until eleven. We would have some fun. It was always a competition. Whoever scored the most runs will bat highest the next mm. 
game and, and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, Saki actually did it. We played a game at the old uh, Hampshire cricket ground and War- Warney was there at the time uh, and Sean Udall was bowling. And Saki goes, I want to go in the back. I want to go in as Night Watchman. So we're saying, so Adam went, all right, Saki, because pretty much anything Saki wanted, <laughs> we made sure we, to keep him happy. We said, okay, Saki, go on, dude. <laughs> anyway, Saki goes in and starts teeing off. <laughs> he, he gets to 30, right? He gets to 30 in about three overs. And we're like, what the hell is going on? So he gets out, comes in. And we're like, Saki, what are you doing? He goes, I, 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 I. I can't block this rubbish bowling. And it wasn't Warney, but it was like um, Sean Udall's bowling might have been Dimmy or whoever. And he just started teeing off. He goes, I'm sorry, I, I can't I can't defend this. <laughs> that's, like, kind of, you do that's kind of I what said, I mean, though. Under- He's not got that want- kind of thinking. No, I said, you do understand what Night Watchman is due to do, like. <laughs> He's there taking, you know, <laughs> I don't know who he was battling with. Might have been Butch or someone. It was like Butch at the other end, like nearly in stitches or worried. He's like, you're here to protect me and you're teeing off. And it's just like, wait, furthermore, no, now the batter is in to try and keep Saki or strike because he's about to lose his wicket. Well, that's the other like- thing. You do see, you see sometimes right towards the end, you'll see the, the night watch starts to fo- face more balls, right? But sometimes mm. you do see when, when they're struggling that the top order batter has to get on a strike because they, they know that you're going to lose a wicket. So again, you're putting more pressure on your other batter who's out there. Uh, but the Saki thing is really interesting. Um, it's incredible that we've talked so much about him because of that particular innings, but also what he's done. But yeah. that follows into my last question of Stuart Broad, right? The Night, the the night, night Hawk. Hawk, right? My, you know, the favorite Marvel character that somehow hasn't got a movie yet, but hopefully Broad yeah. will play uh, when, when Marvel get around to that one. But... There are times, if we, if we are thinking about it more tactically, maybe what Saki did was a bit crazy because it sounds like mm. he went a bit early. Yes, well, he, yeah, he, he went a bit early. Yeah. <laughs> but there are times when actually sending in... Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say Brody started as an all-rounder and obviously he's not an all-rounder anymore. But what he has is, mm. and Saki had it and Murali had it, um, you know, is he had... It's called chaos hitting is what I call it, right? Where you're not yeah. really sure where to bowl to this guy. And if you mm. bowl a good line and leg, they're probably going to hook it over back and square leg. And you're not going to be sure how. And then the next time they're going to try and hit it there and it's going to go over, uh, over slips and all those sorts of things happen. There is an argument at times to throw that sort of wrench in. If you're going to give up, if you're basically saying, look, it, we've got six overs to go. Uh, we can either go out there and try and get nine runs off these six overs, or mm. we're gonna we're gonna give up a wicket here, but maybe we can get thirty or forty runs, and it will completely deflate this team going into stumps. There is an mm. argument for the night hawk that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, I wondered what you, uh, you know, uh, one of the Hall of Fame night watchers, thought about that. <laughs> uh, listen, I it, it's like yeah, well, it feeds into. I suppose the kind of cricket that Stokesy and uh, McCullum are sort of playing, isn't it? Where, you know, he's sort of playing this pantomime character now, isn't it? Where he'll go in and he'll flay the bat. I mean, it's, it's you know, as you say, Brody, when he first came in, was deemed an all-rounded. Obviously, he took that, that massive blow and it knocked his confidence, obviously. And we see sort of, he basically flays it. But when he connects with it, it stays mm. connected. Um, I suppose if... The situation, as you said, um, warrants him possibly to go in and see if he can get a quick 25 30. Um, and it's going to change the game in some way. You know, if it's a low scoring game and you sort yeah. of think your name's on one, okay, it's you've got a free wicket. Go on, go and see what you can do. Then, yes, by all means. But you, you're not suing Stuart Board in to see out a day. You're sending Stuart Board in as the Nighthawk to get 20 and 30 in five overs, four overs. Mm. That's that's what you're doing because obviously the situation of the game may need it. You might be, I don't know, uh, 230 or, you know, depending on the wicket, that that 30 on a decent wicket is worth maybe 60, 70, but that 30 is going to give you maybe enough runs to... Um, it's going to give you enough runs to give you enough time to bowl them out or whatever it yeah. is. You know what I mean? It's, if it warrants it, by all means. But, you know, if you're sending him in to see out five overs, 
as you said, he's most probably not the the guy you're going to send in to to do that, depending on the type of bowlers that he's going to have a face. So against the Aussie attack, coming Stark, Hazelwood, you're most probably thinking, hmm, I'm not too sure with five overs to go if you're sending in straight ball. But if you're sending him in um, because he may go and get a quick 20-30, then, it, well, I mean, then if it warrants it. I think it goes back to where you and I are not against changes in order, right? Mm. But we want to see the batting lineup maximised. And I think that mm. as Night Watch currently exists in cricket, that traditional element where you don't even think about yeah. it, just like, of course you're going to have a Night Watch, right? Like 90% mm. of teams just do it automatically without even just really thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. That's not the best way of using your batting lineup, right? No. And there are much better ways. And I, that's why I like the idea of, you know, the Night Hawk as a, as a theory of, okay, we've got two Night Watchers, right? Jack Leach yeah. is going to go out when there's two overs to go and, you know, we're not particularly worried. Uh, you know, if we if, if he goes out, uh, someone else is only going to have to face three balls and that, mm. we're, you know, we don't care. Uh, but actually, we've got five overs to go. As you said, maybe the scores are level. We've got a chance of getting 30, 40 runs, you know, really quickly and ma- putting a bit of a dent in the other one. And, mm. you know, we have no idea if Stuart Broad's going to make runs no matter what position in yeah. the order he's playing. Maybe there's a couple mm. of spinners on you just like, well, he's more likely to whack the spinners now than we'll any other time. Yeah. Field up, whatever yeah. it may be. But I, yeah. I just think that's the way forward. And that's, that's one thing I would say that is very good about the way we think about cricket now compared to the old days, mm. whereas that those traditional elements can be challenged, right? Yeah. And we can we could say we don't need to do this anymore. We can do it the you know the way that suits us rather than the way that it's always been done. And it also, and I, I tell you one thing as well is it's like these matchups. Sometimes the matchups drive me crazy because you know it's like oh a left hander's in can't bowl a left arm spinner because he's playing with the spin and like but or. Oh, an offies bowling. Well, he can't bowl to the right hand batsman. I'm like, wait on a minute. But if he's your best bowler and he's bowling well, so someone I mean, I think it was like Hasaranga in a game had bowled two for spit, but because was it has it might have been Hasaranga or someone someone bowled like two for nothing and it was like Moen was in and it was like you can't bowl him to Moen because Moen's percentage against spin is ridiculous. I'm thinking. Ralph Rangel just got two for mm. like just bowling. That's what I think sometimes common sense or again, this is the thing with all this information that we're now getting sometimes drives me back. I get me it's very important and it obviously you got stacked to back it up. I'm just like, on any given day, something can change. And I'm thinking if you've got a bowler who's bowling extremely well and he's feeling it. He might even have best chance, even though that matchup in your head and your stats are telling you that that's not going to work. Yep. On that day, it might do. Like, don't just like. So as soon as the left hand backs are in, no left arm spins bowling whatsoever. I'm like, but you know, Akib Hassan's like one of your best one day bowlers, and you're now not bowling because Moen's in the crease. It's like, but he may get him out. Mm. It's just things like that sometimes annoys me um and i i i get i I get it um but i'm just like sometimes just play the situation like sometimes you have a feel as a captain and you know if someone's not quite bowling well and yes the boundaries are extremely small so if he catches it wrong or whatever it's still gonna go to the boundary i'm like but he's bowling bloody well he's he's got two for nine off two overs like now you've not got 12 deliveries that he's now not bowled and you're now bowling a bowler that most probably wouldn't bowl, but because of the matchups, he's now got you've got twelve overs from a quality bowler now not bowling purely because of who's at the crease. Like sometimes you've got to change that up. I think, and I, but that's just going totally off topic. No, it's not but because what you've like, what you've done here is you were angry at the start with an ancient thing in the game, <laughs> and then now you're, you're angry with a modern thing at the game. And I couldn't think of a better way for you to finish this podcast. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Love you.